So I love a good murder mystery. In fact, our whole family is pretty much addicted to British murder mysteries, whether that's, you know, Midsummer or Agatha Christie, whatever, Vera. We, we like a lot of the British murder mysteries. And one of the things I think that appeals to a lot of people who are fans of mysteries is the challenge of trying to figure out the whodunit before you get too close to the end of the book or the movie or the show. And uh, there's a little bit of a, maybe that's a pride thing that we like to figure that out, but we like to think that we know what's going on. But to tell you the truth, the mysteries that I like the most are the ones where I think for 45 minutes to an hour of the program or, or three-fourths of the way through the book, I am convinced that I know exactly who did it. And then you get to the big reveal and... <laughs> okay, so maybe that wasn't fair. I actually hate to be to, to be continued when it flashes up on the screen. Uh, but sometimes those big reveals only show how many things I missed, how many clues I just didn't catch, or there's just a twist that there was no way they actually didn't give you enough of the information for you to get, which actually I think that's kind of a dirty trick with a mystery show. But sometimes that's the way it works. You just didn't have enough information, and you had it all wrong. Today, in Mark chapter 9, go ahead and grab your Bible, we're going to look at the transfiguration of Jesus. The transfiguration is a fascinating event in the ministry and life of Jesus, where he and the disciples go up on a mountain, and he glows, and he talks to people that kind of like the sixth sense are supposed to be dead people. And the disciples who were there, there were three, they see it and their minds are blown, but there's something revealed in that moment that they thought they understood, that they thought they had a grasp on, but they really didn't have a clue. So Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 2, let's grab our Bibles and look at the text. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. And there he transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say. They were so frightened. And then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Okay, so I think if you are Peter, James, and John going up the mountain with Jesus at this point, you think you have a really tight idea of just who he is. You've heard at the baptism of Jesus by John, you've heard that he is the Messiah and by implication then the Son of God. But, you know, they wrestled with that. They didn't fully understand what all that meant, but they, they got a pretty good idea. By then they have seen him do miracles. And uh, we're talking raise the dead, cause the blind to see, heal the sick, walk on water. This is all, all that stuff has already happened. You already know that Jesus is Lord of life and death. Jesus is Lord of nature. Jesus <laughs> is Lord, okay? Peter has already made the confession. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So they got a pretty good idea of who it is they're dealing with. But you know, we can know a lot of things, like we know it here, and not grasp what we know. For example, when you're a kid, you know that there are billions of stars in the sky. But until you look through a really powerful telescope, you know, but you have no idea. You look through that telescope and you see planets, stars, galaxies, 
that you didn't even know were there that before were just part not of the twinkling sky but actually a part of the darkness that happened of course when the Hubble telescope was launched and after they corrected the lens and they could see more clearly what was going on beyond what we'd ever been able to detect before we found out there were whole galaxies we didn't have a clue existed and now with even newer technology we're finding again and again and again that the depths of the universe are so much more than we could possibly have imagined. The same thing happens when we look down into what's smaller. You look through a microscope and when you're a kid the first time it's a pretty weak microscope but still you put that slide underneath the microscope and you look in there and you see bacteria and all those kinds of things. Usually it's bacteria you see first and things from pond scum or algae or diatoms and things and you see those things in that microscope and it blows your mind because things are being revealed to you that you could not possibly have seen, understood, comprehended without the help of that microscope and then it transforms your world. N.T. Wright in his commentary on Mark 9 compares that experience, looking through a microscope as a child for the first time, to what happens to these three men when they witness the transfiguration of Jesus. It is, to use a theological phrase, a divine revelation. They see something they could never have seen with their own eyes to a depth and to a level that blows their mind. So, so think about what it would be like to be in their shoes for a moment. They go up and they think, this is the guy that they had breakfast with. It's a guy they've been traveling with. They've seen him do miraculous, incredible, only God can do kind of things, but they still think you know, of him as their teacher, their friend, their rabbi, their mentor, uh, their discipler, and, and, and yeah, Lord, Son of God whatever that means. I don't think they can possibly quite grasp it. And I, really, I think we struggle every bit as much, maybe more, than they did to grasp that same thing. So get into their shoes for a second and imagine going up that mountain and then suddenly there's fog, there's a cloud that settles in and that's weird and that's eerie but maybe not the craziest thing and then what happens? It's not just a cloud that settles in. It's not just the voice that eventually speaks to them. What happens is that they see Jesus transfigured before them. The Greek word for transfigured, by the way, is a pretty cool word. It's metamorpho, which is, of course, you can already tell, right, the word from which we get our word metamorphosis. And like a child in a classroom, we hear metamorphosis and we immediately go to images of a butterfly or a moth coming out of its cocoon. We think about the transformation that happens from caterpillar to butterfly, something becoming something that it was not before. And that is what metamorphosis is, and that's also why they don't translate, in case you're wondering, why they don't translate the word metamorpho to be metamorphosis, because Jesus doesn't become something in this moment that he wasn't before. Jesus in this moment is revealed as what he already was. So what they see before them is Jesus as the light of the world, Jesus as light. And who else is light? God, the Father. God is light. And so they see now, they're starting to put little puzzle pieces together and it blows their minds. Again, the way it is when you look through that telescope and all those things you'd heard about the stars starts to fall in place as you see their glory and their magnificence. That's how they started to see Jesus in this moment. But wait, there's more. Not only do they see him transfigured into this glorification of light, purity, holiness, divinity, but they also see him 
talking. And who is he talking with? He's talking with Moses, the one who gave Israel the law, the one who was the servant God chose to deliver Israel out of Egypt and out of slavery, and Elijah, the prophet who called God's people back to holiness, back to God, back to light, back to righteousness, back to faithfulness, and spent his life doing just that. So they see two of their greatest heroes, Moses, who represents the law and the exodus, and the prophet, Elijah, who represents the call back to God. And what they see is Jesus not on par with Moses, not in equality with Elijah. Now, maybe at first they thought that, but what they see is Moses and Elijah listening to Jesus. They see Moses and Elijah taking instruction from Jesus. Moses and Elijah coming to understand God's plan through Jesus. What they see is that Jesus is not one in a line of great men. He is not another prophet in a line of great prophets. Moses and Elijah, both really prophets. He's not just a new lawgiver. What they see is that Jesus is the one before whom Moses and Elijah bow in worship. He is the one before whom Moses and Elijah bow in subservience to his authority as the Son of God. They see Jesus. Maybe in ways they understood him to already be the Son of God and in authority, but with far greater understanding and depth. And all of this kind of has to sink in for them over time, but the message is there very clearly in this moment. Now, Peter's first reaction is actually the desire to honor Jesus. He does. It, I love how the text says, Peter didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> Luke says this, Mark says this, both. Mark says that it's because Peter was scared. And why wouldn't he be? By the time this is all over, he will have heard the voice of God. He will have seen the glory of Christ. He will have seen Jesus reigning over Moses and Elijah, which only God can do. He's scared. You know, the cloud settles in, the, the, the light shines, and the glory is known. It's kind of a, it's a scary moment. I think that's a normal reaction that he has. So I also think his reaction to want to honor them is normal. So he says to Jesus, Jesus, I know what we got to do. We're going to build three tabernacles, three tents, three places of worship. We might say three shrines to Moses and to Elijah and to you, Jesus. I think you're as great as them. That's kind of what he's implying and what he's saying in this. And this is why I say that in a way, part of what we're supposed to get out of this is that Moses, awesome. Elijah, awesome. But Jesus, more awesome than awesome. He is not on par, he is not on level with Moses and Elijah. What we're supposed to see in this moment, what they were supposed to get in that moment, is this. You don't hold Jesus to the same level you hold Moses and Elijah. That seems, from a human point of view, like that would be an honor. And that's what Peter is thinking when he says this. But that would be to bring Jesus down. We as humans have a bad tendency to bring Jesus down. He's a good teacher, but that's all. He's a prophet with a message from God, but that's all. He was somebody who knew a lot about life, but that's all. And what God is doing in this moment is removing the ability for us to see Jesus as anything else but God. This is that, that moment of decision that C.S. Lewis so brilliantly brings us to in his book, mere Christianity, at some point we must come to the realization 
that if Jesus is what he claims to be, if he can do what he and what scripture and what eyewitnesses claim he did, and if he is who God himself says he is, then I have to come to a place where I decide. He's not just a prophet. He is not merely a man. He is the Son of God. And I have to come to that decision for myself, looking at the evidence. And God in this moment is giving us evidence. He gives us the evidence through the glorification of the transfiguration that he is of a nature different from Moses, from Elijah, and from us, from Peter, James, and John, that he is divine, that he doesn't glow with some sort of a weird parlor trick. This is not some sort of a magician's trick, but that his intrinsic divinity cannot be hidden forever, and it is revealed there before them. And so they have to see this Jesus is God. But it's not just that, not just the one witness of his glorification. Then there is the witness of Moses and Elijah. Why? Why did Jesus choose to speak to them and in front of these disciples? Because no one has more credibility to the people of Israel than Moses and Elijah. These men, Peter, James, and John, revered what Jesus said after this more because Moses testified, more because Elijah testified, more because Moses recognized the authority of Jesus Christ as Son of God, because Elijah recognized Jesus Christ as the Son of God. This bears witness to who he really is. They are saying, he's not just one of us guys, he is our Lord decision to be made, now put into your court, right? And so that then becomes part of the testimony at the top of the mountain that John will write about later on in his writings, that Peter will uh, give witness to in his and in his testimony to Mark, who wrote this gospel built upon testimony from the Apostle Peter himself. And then there is the voice. No sooner has Peter gotten out of his mouth, hey, let's build some shrines here. Let's build three tabernacles, one to Moses, one to Elijah, and one to you, Jesus. Then the fog settles in and the voice speaks. As I think a little bit of a correction, maybe a rebuke's too strong, of Peter to say, no, let me fix this for you. I, I mentioned Hubble earlier. Well, when Hubble first went up, the lens already revealed incredible majestic things of space, but it showed them in a blur and there needed to be a correction. So as you probably know, NASA had to send a crew up to correct the lens. And basically like me, the Hubble telescope worked with a contact lens. That's what God now provides for Peter. Peter, you're almost getting it. Let me make it even clearer. And a voice speaks from the cloud. This is my son. Is there any doubt now who Jesus is? God speaks from the fog and says, this is my son. Like God speaks through the fog of our life, our confusion and our lack of understanding at times. This is my son. Listen to him. Listen to him. Maybe we need to emphasize those words a couple of different ways. Listen to Him. Like when we're trying to solve a big mystery, we think we know so much about what is going on in the world and we think we have great sources, but we will not know the truth of who Jesus is and really ultimately who we are and who we are to God and who God is to us until we listen to Jesus. They don't understand all that's going on. In fact, right after this, they're going to walk off going, what did he mean by that? What did he mean about resurrection? What did he mean about? And what did he mean about? And what did he mean about? They've got a lot of questions in their head, and they're going to ask him some more before this book is over. God's answer, listen to what he tells you. 
Listen to how he answers. Listen to what he has to say. Because he's going to make life clear. He's going to make eternity clear. He's going to answer, why a resurrection? Why a cross? Why does Jesus have to go to his death? Why do we have to go through all these things? Why do we need to bear witness? Listen to him. He'll tell you. And he speaks the same to your life. You may have a lot of why questions. God, why am I going through what I'm going through? Listen to him. Listen to what he says. Listen to what he says comes through hardship. Listen to what he says about what comes through faithfulness through hard things. Listen to what he says about how he will provide for you, how he will give you wisdom, how he will deliver you through whatever life brings, how he will bless you in the end. Listen to him and you'll get the answers that you seek. Things will become clearer. You will find your moments where you will be reading in the Word of God and you will come across a, a truth from Jesus and like the transfiguration suddenly you will go oh that's what I was supposed to get that's what he meant by that God will continually reveal himself through Jesus and he will continually reveal himself through his teachings if 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 you will listen to him and that's why we study God's Word. It's why we have this series. It's why we get together at church. It's why we read the Bible as much as we can. Because, as Paul says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the words of Christ. Get into God's Word. Get into the words of Christ and listen to Him and see Jesus and see God with new eyes and see your life with new eyes through Him. Thank you for joining us today, and we encourage you to come and worship with us this Sunday at the Early Church of Christ at 10 o'clock. God bless you. Have a great week.